having. So um, I've done amazing projects. I'm grateful for these jobs on which I composed, lots of mobile games. Uh, my latest job was this music for an exhibit um, at the Kennedy Space Center. And I also have worked as an arranger and orchestrator for some amazing projects, which I loved and am um, very grateful. So just a couple of re brief reviews, mostly for developers. Developers know that music provides the emotional depth of the gaming experience. But the score of your game is also a powerful branding device for your game. Uh, it defines the genre, aesthetics, the world, characters, factions, the story, time, and location. Um, what's most powerful to me is how music makes us remember the entire gameplay experience. Remember for a moment the iconic theme for Mario, or Tetris, or Halo. As soon as I mention these titles, do you guys have like an instant picture, memory picture of the music to these games? Um, for instance, I personally will never forget my experience of playing Modern Warfare 2, which was really frustrating. I kept getting killed on one level. And I always associate that gameplay with that droning, D, droning music in D minor that just went on throughout the whole level. And that's my physical memory of just that awesome game that kept beating me. So for a game composer, one of the most important tasks is to create a sonic world that fits the vision and the aesthetics of the game like a glove and to make the game a memorable experience because this is what we remember. Um, in today's market, there are thousands of games. There's an ocean of product. And maybe the, the, the goal of this talk is to actually make the developers aware of the fact that you could use the score as a powerful branding device of your game, a very specific score, a very unique score that has a very specific sound and fits your game perfectly and sounds like nothing else or some, somewhat like something else, but is very unique. And ultimately, the most important thing is that good music will always elevate the production and artistic value of your game. So with this talk, which is kind of very practical, I hope to give you practical tips on the collaboration between developers and composers, or developers and the audio team, uh, and, and how to find the, the style, the, the, the voice of your, of your score. So when you're ready, when the developer is ready to commission a composer to write music, regardless of how big or small that score is going to be, come to us with a very clear vision of your game, because Composers will always try to support, to the best of their ability, the vision of that game. Uh, talk to us about the aesthetics. For instance, I'm a very visual person. I respond really well to um, environment art, character art, costumes, weaponry, um, just all the visual components that make up the game. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm kind of an okay game player. I do play a lot of uh, games, but the, the aesthetics of, the, of your visual aesthetics are going to really inspire me. Now, we also discuss in these collaborative conversations that happen first, something I call tone lineage. Um, I could describe it like, how, how is your game going to be similar in tone? And I'm talking about overall tone. This is the overall gestalt of your game. How is your game similar to, um, in tone to games that preceded it? And, and then we talk about how is your game going to fit in that lineage of tradition and innovation? These are two very powerful concepts for me. Um, I love and adore the tradition, I've studied the tradition. So basically there's this whole spectrum, spectrum between very traditional, very conventional games and also very innovative, fresh, completely unique games that sort of hit you and come at you from left field and of course the whole entire spectrum. Um, in my own composing, I've composed a lot of traditional music and I also have tried to push myself and be innovative on some projects. So these are all questions that we discuss in these opening conceptual conversations, which I love and adore. It's my favorite part of the collaborative process, these opening lunches or Skype conversations when we talk about ideas. And ideas flow back and forth between the creatives, between the developers and their composing team or composers. Um, one of the most important goals that I set upon myself when I collaborate with anybody game maker, filmmaker, is to understand as much as I can about your taste, musical taste. We talk about your favorite soundtracks from similar games or your favorite soundtracks from your childhood because all of us are so much driven and defined by our taste. Our taste in music, our taste in art, our taste in games, in cinema, and um, 
it, as, as a collaborative composer, one of my biggest tasks is to learn as much as I can about your vision, your ideas, and your taste. And I, I just by asking questions, you know, tell me what you like. And I do it with game makers, I do it with filmmakers. It always helps me to understand what kind of music you're most likely to resonate with and respond really well. Um, ultimately, our job as composers is to find that signature style, signature sound, that's going to define your game as a sonic experience, and that's going to become that memorable experience. So that's, again, conversations and prototyping, and um, the goal is to have that signature style for your characters and for your game. So the kind of questions, so basically the process for me always has been from the bigger picture, which I called Gestalt, kind of coming down and focusing in on more details. So, so far I talked about the big picture, ideas, concepts, aesthetics, style, lineage. Now I'm gonna start get more, getting more specific. And these are the kind of questions I ask my collaborators. So what musical elements will work for your score? And actually, I've been very blessed to work with really articulate game developers, and sometimes I have to kind of ask more questions to get more information. And then the other question, which is just as valid, is what elements do you not want? What elements will not work for your score? And we kind of go and make a list. Um, so basically last year, I worked on this amazing collaborative experience. It's a, it's a game called Mayhem. It's, okay, let me now get this straight. It's a, a mobile, synchronous, multiplayer, like eSports shooter. It got awarded at South by Southwest. I'm proudly wearing the shirt, the t-shirt today. And um, so it's like a, I'll show you a couple of visuals. I wanted to speak about this game today because it was a beautiful collaboration and the developers were very articulate. It was like one of these perfect, perfect situations of beautiful uh, back and forth and collaborative process. So just a couple of visuals to kind of give you a sense of the visual aesthetics. So it's, um, um, they were really good with their conceptual guidance in their briefs, and I called out literally from their brief. This is, everything is a quote. This is what they told me. The game is a sci-fi adventure, not too distant future. The costumes and weaponry blend the past and the present. And uh, so it's not too advanced, not too sci-fi, not too far in a distant future. This is one of the most amazing metaphors I've ever been given by a collaborator. I loved it so much. This was in their brief, more aliens, less Star Wars. So for somebody like me who adores science fiction, science fiction and really lives and breeds the whole vernacular, the whole you know, fantasy science fiction horror, this quote meant more than like hours and hours and hours of conversation. So I would encourage, you to, in, encourage your collaborators to kind of give you these metaphors because they're a powerful tool of collaboration and they really save us a lot of uh, you know, prototyping and headache. That's, that was also part of their initial brief. So uh, the visual style is a blend of sci-fi and contemporary war game. So that, that, that this is what they wanted. They wanted the music to be exactly that middle ground, not too sci-fi, which would be too much electronica and synths, or not too much action, which is like the big, because uh, I'm known for doing, doing a lot of action games, like, you know, Gears of War, or, you know, big strings and big horn melodies. So exactly middle ground, and not too sci-fi. So a um, couple more visuals. So then we started, so after talking about these more specific details, then we got even more specific. Global considerations for the score. Music is a tertiary audio element. The sound effects and the environment ambiences always take precedence uh, because they're part of the auditory experience. Music is a tertiary audio element. So and then we started getting even more focused on the style. So they wanted a hybrid style, which is orchestra, a little bit of orchestra and electronica. They wanted pulsing synth textures, because that's modern scoring. They wanted um, ambient pads to suggest science fiction and to sprinkle some sound effects here and there to, to spell out that the game is a science fiction game. So this is all, again, from the wonderful brief I received from my collaborators. So what they did not want, and this was, again, just as useful as anything else, is they did not want big, soaring melodies, especially no brass melodies. They did not want busy chord progressions, and they did not want bombastic choir, because choir is associated with more like epic fantasy, and, um, and they did not want that. So um, I'm going to go ahead and play you a little bit of the gameplay, just for fun, and uh, then I'm going to play the music, so you have a chance to see the visual, and then you have a chance to focus on the music. So here's a little bit of gameplay. Um, from this shooter.
for, for the composers in the audience, I also wanted to play just the music alone so you can isolate all the elements, you know, the groove, the, the pulses, the very uh, non-melodic material, but still kind of, you know, it's still orchestral, except no soaring melodies. So um, this is for, okay. All right, just a minute. There were a couple of campaigns. I wrote a couple of battle tracks, and then there is um, the, obviously the menu music. And this, this is again from the directions I received from my collaborators. Much less stressful, serious and foreboding, subdued, not frenetic, because the campaigns are very frenetic. They did not want massive choirs. They did not thunder. They did not want drums, and they did not want loud string melodies. Again, I was just so lucky to have this incredibly um, wonderful guidelines given to me by my collaborators. And this is what I did with these guidelines. So this was that collaborative experience. I wanted to now switch gears and talk about another fantastic collaboration, which is my most recent job. It's not a game. It's my music for a museum exhibition at the Kennedy Space Center. I got this job through um, a game connection. And also, the, co the composing was um, 3D movies and also interactive pods. So I figured it's interactive, and I could present it here. So. Um, it's called Heroes and Legends. That's the name of the exhibition at the Kennedy Space Center, and uh, it hosts the American Astronaut Hall of Fame. Uh, here's just me standing in front of the exhibition. I wanted to acknowledge one of my most cherished collaborators, an extraordinary person and professional, John Rod, the recording, mixing, and mastering engineer on this job and all my jobs, all my projects. John, would you please stand up and thank you for a fantastic work and always just making everything sound so awesome. So um, basically, I'm going to play for you um, one musical piece which was uh, accompanying a 3D film um, that tells a story about uh, the Gemini 8, um, uh, Gemini 8 mission. The Gemini 8 mission was uh, 
in um, 19, 1966, and for the first time, there was a manned capsule and also an unmanned ship called the Agena that they had to undock, and it was really complicated. And that's one instance where um, things went wrong with something in, in the capsule. There was some mechanical mal malfunction, and the mission had to be aborted. So my music was supposed to be... Um, and that's the, that's the capsule, that's the, just the experience. You're in the theater, you're watching this amazing earth. All, everything is 3D and uh, the capsule just flies right in front of you, right above you. So um, the music of, for this 3D film was supposed to capture, it was modern, uh, modern action and it was supposed to capture first the, the joy of space because the first thing we see in a 3D movie is what we see from inside the cabin outside. And then I had to have action music for the malfunctioning system. And then there's this increasing level of tension and peril, um, ever increasing tension. And the, the stakes get higher and higher with each musical structure. And I had to build this and keep building and keep building. And at the end, um, the mission is aborted. So I had to capture the hero who's been defeated. So the people's lives are saved, which is good. They kind of failed the mission, but we saved their lives. So it's still a success. So. Um, this is the kind of this is how the conversation went with the clients. The, the, the first idea that they presented to me is they said, "Well, we really really like the movie The Right Stuff. Uh, it's a film from 1983. Have you guys watched The Right Stuff? Raise your hands." So it's like one of these iconic movies about um, cosmonauts. It's scored by Bill Conti with a very traditional score, totally orchestral and a beautiful melodic, almost like Bach, almost like classical music. Um, and they did not want choir. This was one of their um, requirements. Now, I thought to myself, well, that score is awesome, but it was composed in 1983, so now how do I sort of um, turn their idea around and still make them feel as if they're giving me the idea, but like kind of put my ideas like in their brain? So what I suggest that that's a very important skill for composers to have, to kind of share ideas and be really open, be really respectful, but also present ideas and make your collaborators think that they came up with the idea. So I said, how about we approach this entire score and make it modern and timeless. So the timeless component is going to be the classical music, classical big um, strings and, and horn tunes and melodies and classical chord progressions, almost like Bach. So we have that classical component, which is our timeless component. But as far as the modern sound is concerned, I mean, all of us have grown basically listening to these very modern, pulsing, electronic, percussive scores. So I, I felt compelled to have very strong um, percussion arrangement and synths. So that's how I combined the traditional melodic themes for the heroes and orchestra with very modern arrangement with busy percussion and synths. And it, it worked beautifully. So that was, that's how I sort of turned their idea around and added my own input, and they totally went, I mean, they just really loved the music. They went with the idea. So I'll, I cannot show you the movie because it's part of this 3D thing, so I'll just show you some screenshots from a very early um, rendering of the movie that I was given. It just shows you mostly the inside, the astronauts, and that's the capsule and the Agena undocking, and they spin. Um, so um, that's another visual. So here, I'm going to play the music, and... Uh, there's like seven structures, uh, beauty of the space, and I'm gonna point as we, as the music progresses, you'll hear it very clearly, it's really, the music tells the story very clearly. So let me now uh, play this music, and uh, you can imagine the story that the music tells.
here's the last image. So I wanted to open now for questions. I'm eager to answer your questions. Um, please be sure to fill out the evaluation forms. That's my email. It's okay to contact me. Uh, check me out on Twitter and everything else. I welcome your questions now. Thanks. Hello, Panka. Thank you so much. That was fantastic. I was just curious if you'd be willing to share any techniques that you like to really um, give that lower end ear candy that is great in your mixes. Um, if you have anything that you particularly enjoy, because obviously just the orchestral samples probably can't produce that low um, warmth. Okay, so we recorded brass and strings live. Um, sometimes I use a little bit more, like one more cello or two more celli, and but then the real the real magic is John Rod sitting right there. He's fantastic. Mm -hmm. He's the one who really shapes that low end, because I've worked so much in um, horror and fantasy. There is always uh, that music competing with the sound effects, and um, I've, I had to I had so many conversations with people in horror games, basically saying, that's your biggest goal: how to shape, how to sculpt the low end, so we still hear the machine guns and they don't sound like popcorn, but um, so that the music really works. See, because all you hear, sound effects, folly, dialogue, it all goes into the ears. So the music has to be very carefully sculpted around the other elements in the audio. And me coming from a genre background, having done a lot of horror films and a lot of my music having been cut and not used, I, I learned the hard way to be incredibly sensitive. But talk to John, he's gonna give you the magic, the actual technicality. I just write the music, the notes. But it starts with you, putting in the musical elements, do you have any particular nice combinations? Yeah, I, I have ways, I have a really specific way how I voice the brass. I always use octaves, two octaves, sometimes three octaves. Um, I worked for many years for the orchestrator of, Bruce, of, of Hans Zimmer, called Bruce Fowler, and he taught me how to add one extra lower octave in the tuba. So I have a particular way how I vo voice the brass that's just really heavy, like really punchy, and it really kind of shows in all my orchestrations for Steve Jablonski. Um, same thing with the strings, just really beef up the low end in octaves, but never like in anything less, less than an octave. So in, in the composition, in the arrangement, that's what I do, just kind of beef it up. Awesome, thank you. Thank you. Hi, so for uh, the developer who may or may not be somewhat musically inclined, do you have a sense of that you prefer to have uh, direction from them in uh, non-musical terms, like timid, warm, uh, you know, sensual, or that you would actually, uh, to, to what degree are you open to very specific, like, I, I want this to be an oboe? Uh, Thank you. This is a perfect, awesome question. Thank you so much. The best collaborative process is if the de developers speak with their composers in terms of ideas. First, talk to us about ideas. Talk to about us about emotions, mechanics, storytelling, tradition, innovation. The large, big concepts. So that's the one aspect of wonderful collaboration. The other collaboration is music. Just give us like five MP3s and say, well, I really love this. Follow, you know, I like this about this. I don't like this about this other thing. So when we have both the concepts, and the music equally represented. Music in terms of style guide from previous games or movies, this is just the best because we know your concepts and your vision, but we also know the kind of music that speaks to you and you feel is going to represent your game. So if you only talk to us with wor in words, then words are slippery. I mean, we could talk about music and I'd say one thing, you, you interpret, so there's, there could be this misunderstanding, but when there's the sense of concepts and aesthetics and ideas, also reinforced by your favorite music that you feel is gonna fit with the game. Uh, that company, uh, the company that made Mayhem, they do, did give me two MP3s. They said, this is what we like. Make it like this, but unique for our game. Um, so I would say the best collaborative approach is ideas and your favorite music combined together. And then the composers, they have ways of filtering. They have intuition and just skills and, and experience to filter. And also, all of us, I encourage all composers to just play as many games, watch as many movies, learn the genres, learn music, because that kind of becomes part of your intelligence as a composer. Uh, I, I just voraciously play games and watch games all the time, so that's what we do. Um, but I would say concepts and music. Yes. Hi. Um, I was wondering for the Gemini eight piece, uh, how, or do you have a process for going from the, the general timeline of the presentation of the the film and the to the specifics of like tempo things like that like does the overall length of the piece help determine your tempo do you set that independently and motivically the structure 
and everything. So that's a really good question also. So the entire uh, 3D movie is with dialogue. So all the music was under dialogue. And all the three, because it's like a documentary essentially, um, except it's really elaborate with special effects, which you didn't see here. So um, I, that's one of my first assignments, and it's very challenging. People ask me what's the happiest and most challenging part. The happiest part is these conceptual conversations I just spoke about. They're the funnest. The research and concepts is awesome. The hardest part is when I open the blank template, and the movie is there, it's lined up, and my job is to pace the music, you know, really structure the music. So I always begin globally. That's how I work. Not everybody is like this. That's my process. I would um, kind of mark the movie. This is, remember that chart I had with the energy curve kind of going up? So I had to sort of, and then, and then you have to hit beats in any linear media, which cinematics in games are, or film scoring, or this 3D entertainment. It's linear media, so we have to hit uh, moments where the energy changes or the story changes. Mm -hmm. So that's the first thing I do and it's challenging um, because I haven't set the tempos yet and sometimes I have to lock these markers so I lock the markers right. and then I experiment with different tempos until I find the right tempo. Cool. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, I have a question about discussing budget with developers. Like, you know, if you get even just one live musician, it can help supplement the sample libraries. And I was wondering if you have any tips on how to kind of communicate with developers about recording budgets or anything relating to that. That's a really good question. Um, in m most of my games are, I mean, this is purely samples, but um, I always make a case if, if there's like a one musician, for instance, this is just a wild example, electric cello that can add so much mm -hmm. texture and variety and uh, the cello seems to be such a magical instrument for media scoring. Um, you ha it's all conversations. It's all trying to sell the idea that even a small tiny budget by adding one instrument can add so much artistic value and uh, it's the conversation that you have to have. But I would say, try to start small. You know, you can't really say, oh, you have a small model game, I'm gonna record orchestra, because they're not gonna need that, and they won't be able to afford. But basically suggest, how about we have one very versatile instrument, maybe a wind instrument or a plucked, plucked instruments also work really well, or maybe electric cello, and then work with one musician, or maybe work with three musicians, or four. This is something you can afford, and it's a small, part of the budget, but adds so much. So the whole idea is that you're gonna spend a little bit of money and get so much more on your return of investment. That's how I would approach it. That's how I've always approached it for all these years that I worked. I still work with a lot of um, independent games and mobile games and indie films, and the pitch is always the same. Let's just spend a little bit of money and get fantastic live cello player. I just did it on my horror film with a very low budget. So the idea is you spend a little bit of money to get huge result. Thank you. You're welcome. Any more questions? I think we're out of time. Okay, guys, I'll be outside if you want to talk to me. Uh, thanks again so much for coming. Um, thank you. Okay, thanks.